Alrighty, uh, well today we are um, almost halfway through. I think this is week nine. Uh, next week will be week ten. We'll be halfway through our uh, our whole lesson here uh, in biblical interpretation, right, and grasping God's word. So today we're going to be looking at this book. Uh, also, we've got it in uh, the the larger textbook, but we're going to be looking at chapter six. So if you've got this book, you can see. Uh, chapter 6 is where most of the notes are going to be coming from. I think it's chapter 7 or chapter 8 in the, the large uh, textbook. But we're going to be talking about uh, literary context. Um, how many of you remember what we talked about last week? Do you remember a little bit of what the theme was last week? If you've got the book, you can actually turn back to chapter 5, and it's the title of the book, of the, of the chapter. The, uh, the historical and cultural context. So what we really looked at last week is um, what is the, uh, how do we understand what was happening in history during that time? So the, the whole point of this, this class and what we're doing is we're really trying to figure out how do we study the Bible? How do we study the Word of God? So um, I know we've got a, a new student, Guillermo, here today. So I want to just kind of give an overview, if you will. Uh, bear with me for just a second, just to kind of walk through the different steps. So what we do when we're looking at how do we interpret the Bible, the method that we're using for this class, and there's lots of different methods in Bible study, but what we're doing for this class is we're, look, we're, we're kind of using the analogy of a journey. So what we're doing is we're taking a journey through the Word of God. And, and the way that we do that is we start in their town. Uh, and what we mean by that is we look at the, the Scripture and we try to figure out what was going on in that, in that era at that time and what was God trying to say to the original audience. So we're, we're, we start off in their town. Then we leave the town and we start walking down the road. We get to a river. We call this the cultural river. And this basically is a barrier that keeps us from interpreting it in our context. There's, there's differences between that context, that uh, original audience, and us, the modern audience. And so what we do when we get to this river, step two of the process is that we try to see what are those differences. We want to measure the width. We call that measuring the width of the river. And so we want to figure out what are the differences between us uh, as a modern audience and the original audience. Once we've figured out what those differences are, then we actually cross what we call the principalizing bridge. So this, in this imaginary journey that we're taking, we, we build this bridge and we cross it. The principalizing bridge is just basically the theological principle. So this theological principle will take us from the original audience over to now uh, the modern audience. And so what we're going to do is we continue on the journey, we cross the bridge, we get to our town, what we call our town, and in our town, what we're really concerned about there is we're concerned about the application. So we've got our theological principle, we've understood it, now what we want to do is we want to figure out how do we apply that principle to our life. And so that's the interpretive journey. Um, and we're, what we're doing is we're learning how to do that these last several weeks. And so we've talked about, you know, how do you understand the language that's used in the scripture? We talked about what Bible translations to use in the scripture. We talked about uh, how to understand sentences. We talked about grammar. Uh, in, in the scripture, it's important to, to look at different grammatical types, you know, compare and contrast and, and uh, lists and how do we understand those things. Last week, we looked at how do we understand uh, the, the historical and cultural context. And so I gave you guys some resources. Y'all remember some of those resources? What, what were some of the resources that we talked about <laughs> last week? Do you remember? Commentaries, those are just books that comment on the scriptures, right? Uh, what else? What were some of the other resources? Concordance. Software, Logos is a software, Concordances, uh, those have cross-references, right, of different scriptures. Um, study Bibles is another one. Uh, Bible dictionaries is another, uh, another one that, that uh, we use to, to define certain words in uh, the Bible. So these are all ways that we can kind of look at the historical context, the cultural context of the time. Today we're going to look at literary context. Um, the author says this, The most important principle of biblical interpretation is that context determines meaning. Context determines meaning. Um, 
the author starts with this very interesting story. He says, imagine you're a college student, you're walking there on campus one day, and some person just walks up to you and says, go for it. Just walks up to you randomly and says, go for it. Now, what is your reaction to that? H how do you react to that, that one-liner? You know, some of you may say, sure, okay, thank you. Others of you may say, wait, wait, wait hold on, hold on, what are you talking about? What's, what's going on? You want to know a little bit more about that. Uh, some of you may just look at the person and think, uh, as the author says, that that person is uh, one fry short of a Happy Meal, right? Uh, they're, they're maybe not all there. Why did this person just randomly come up to me and say, sure, uh, go for it, right? Um, the, the, what the author is really trying to get at is this, is he's saying, it's hard to understand just one phrase when you take it out of the context that it's supposed to be in. The problem happens many times where we will read one scripture outside of its context and you can really force and twist that scripture to mean whatever you want it to mean. And that's a dangerous thing to do when we're, we're looking at biblical interpretation because we want to understand what is God trying to communicate to us through his word? What is he trying to say? And so many times we can look at one little phrase in there and we can twist it and try to, try to make it fit and make it say something that it really isn't saying. And so that's why the author says one of the most important principles of biblical interpretation is that context determines meaning. We have to understand the context of that scripture. So they, he goes on and, and says this in the book. I thought this was interesting. He says, imagine our story, right, where, where this person says, go for it. And so he goes, right, and he, and he says, well, what is this go for it trying to, to say? So he dances around scriptures, finds a couple of verses that provide the answer he so desperately once with a timetable to boot. He finds 1 Corinthians 7 36 C that says they should get married. That's it. That's all he pulled out was just they should get married from that scripture. And then John chapter 13 verse 27, flipping through the scriptures, he finds it and it says what you are about to do, do quickly. Now, imagine he builds his whole life and so all of a sudden he sees this and he thinks, you know what? I'm going to get married and I'm going to do it quickly. That would be a very, very bad way to do your biblical interpretation. That would not, and that might lead to some, some messiness, right, in that relationship there. And, and what's even worse is if you look at these scriptures, right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 7.36. Uh, the Apostle Paul is giving advice to engaged men in light of distressing circumstances in Corinth. He says, if anyone thinks he is acting improperly towards the virgin he is engaged to and, is, uh, getting along, and she is getting along in years, he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They, and this is where he pulled that one little scripture out. They should get married. But, here is the, the second part of that scripture, but the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better. So, I mean, you even look at that scripture, he who does not get married does even better, right? And, and so what we see here is he took that scripture, right, completely out of context, try to apply one little part to his life without reading the whole thing. And then on top of that, not even understanding why Paul was writing this to the church in Corinth, right? Uh, there was a specific reason why he was saying it to this specific church, uh, given some of the persecution and the different things that they were going through there. So... Again, the most important principle of biblical interpretation is that context determines meaning. We want to understand uh, the meaning. Now, one of the first things that we need to do in understanding uh, the context is understanding literary genre. Um, what's a genre? Someone tell me, give me, give me a, kind of a, a thought on that. What's a genre? A romance, okay, that's a genre of movie, I guess. Uh, but, but just in, in general, uh, let's, uh, what does the word genre mean? I should have uh, used it that way. <laughs> yeah, genre. Uh -huh. 
a subject, right? It's a subject. So you've got it in films, right? You've got action films, you've got romance films, you've got uh, comedies, you've got all of these different things, right? Uh, it's the same thing with literature. So literature is going to have different types of genre. Here's the really neat thing about the Bible. The Bible has different types of genre in it. Uh, there are different types of genre or types of books in the Bible. We've got books of wisdom. We've got books of poetry. We have letters. All of these different types of books. Now, I'm going to do something right now. Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to fly through this really, really quickly uh, on the books of the Bible. I'm going to give you just an overview, a list of the books of the Bible and the different genres. And we're going to get more into this um, the week that we start breaking down the books of the Bible. So... The Bible is broken down into two sections. Who knows the two sections? The Old Testament and the New Testament. That one was easy, all right? Uh, that one's easy. All right, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is broken down into these different sections. You've got narrative. You've got law, which is called the Pentateuch. You've got prophets. Um, and inside of the prophets, you have minor and major. And then you have books of wisdom slash poetry. So uh, these are sort of the, the, the categories or the genres that we have inside of the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to just, again, I'm going to move really quickly through this. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later on. If you want this list, I can give it to you in a, in a document. But inside of these, let's break down what narrative books are. Narrative books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, uh, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Narrative, I'm going to summarize this. Narrative is basically stories, right? Uh, it has a sequential time action. So, todo está en orden. Hay una orden en estas historias. So, they have a story uh, format or a story form of literature. You're going to see different characters. Van a tenemos, uh, tener diferentes uh, 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 how do I say characters in Spanish. Car car characters. Um, in la historia. So that's what narrative, when we read a narrative story, we're, we're wanting to understand it as that. This is a, a, a historical story, right? It's trying to tell something that is going on. So you're going to see characters, you're going to see all those things inside of narrative. Now, you have law, the law, which is the Pentateuch. This is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, these are those first five books of the Bible. Um, a uh, law uh, refers to, to legal materials found throughout Scripture. Um, and so these are, you know, you're going to see some of those uh, books. You're going to read them and you're like, man, this is a lot of laws. What does this have to do? There's meaning. There's reason behind those things. And we'll get into that when we get into the books of the law. Prophets, major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These are the major prophets. The minor prophets are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So these are your, your minor prophets. Uh, these prophets, they, they gave special insight, right, uh, into what God was wanting to say to the people of that time. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking at, uh, in some of those uh, prophets, you're going to look at historical events that actually happen. Some of those prophets are talking about future events that are going to be happen, that are going to happen. But the prophets are speak, specifically speaking to uh, the covenant faithfulness that God has to his people, both past and present. All right. So that's what the prophets are really about. Then the books of wisdom. Uh, wisdom, you've got Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Again, uh, this is a literary work uh, where we are going to look at some of these things and not necessarily always take them literally. Uh, they've got flowery image. You're going to see a lot of metaphors in there. Um, a proverb is a writing that formulates a contrasting imaginative. Oh, no, this is a, a I think it's parable is what they're trying to say there. But uh, you're, what you're going to see basically is that in these wisdom books of poetry, you're going to have very specific emotional responses that it's trying to elicit. Just read the book of Psalms. If you read the book of Psalms, man, something, you know, one minute you're on top of the, the world, right, with, uh, you know, David or the psalmist, and the next moment you're in the dumps and you're, you're trying to figure out what, what's going on. So these books of wisdom and poetry really touch on those things. Now, the New Testament. Again, I know I'm moving fast, but we got a lot of ground to cover uh, today. So uh, we've got letters. Uh, within the, the New Testament, um, you've got 
Uh, the Pauline letters, this is Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Someone tell me for 10 extra bonus points. Um, why do they call them Pauline letters? Because, Paul, man, Juan, you got the 10, 10 bonus points, right? You got to share your bonus points with the people, all right? Uh, because Paul wrote them. So these are letters written by Paul to different churches, different individuals, right? Then we have general letters. These are general letters. Uh, these are Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, Jude. Um, many times those letters will have the name of the person that wrote those letters in there. And usually general letters will be written specifically for um, like a larger audience, okay? So you're going to see that in your letters. Again, uh, letters like the, the rest of Scripture are written, uh, they were written for us. This is an important part here. They're written for us, but not to us, okay? So we, you know, one of the things that sometimes happens is we get very egotistical when we read the Bible and think, oh, this is written directly for me, right, uh, and to me. They were written to an original audience before they were ever written to us. So we need to keep that in mind when we're studying the Scripture. Uh, they, they are for us. We can pull the truths from them. There are theological principles that apply to us today, but... Um, let's understand that they, those are written in a specific context to a specific audience, all right? Um, again, and we're going to get into this when we get into letters um, uh, in, in a few weeks, all right? Then the Gospels. The Gospels is another genre of, um, of a book, right? And this is going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Um, we're putting Acts in here. Uh, Acts, uh, a lot of times, is more of a, a historical book, uh, but... Both the Gospels and, uh, and the book of Acts, they, they read sort of like a narrative, sort of like a history, because you're going to have a story with characters and a timeline. So uh, just to kind of know that this is another genre. And when we're thinking about the book, we want to understand uh, you know, what it's, what it's, uh, the genre that it's in. All right. So um, Gospel, uh, Evangelion uh, is the Greek word for that. It means good news. Uh, it, it, the Gospels have the good news of Jesus, the story of Jesus. Um, history, again, we've got the book of Acts here. Uh, this is um, a, a book of history that's really going to chronicle how the early church began. Uh, and so you're going to see the story of the early church, a story spanning 25 to 30 years of history in about 28 chapters. Um, so that's uh, uh, books of history in the New Testament. And then the, fu the final genre uh, of book in uh, the New Testament is apocalyptic. Uh, apocalyptic, uh, this is the book of Revelation. Revelation is a unique genre of literature because it combines apocalyptic prophecy and an epistle in one. And so you're going to, we'll talk a little bit more about how we interpret that, but uh, we want to, to be careful when we're interpreting, interpreting the book of Revelation uh, and we want to understand it within its context, you know, why it was written, uh, to whom it was written for, and, uh, and then look at some of the, the, the language that's used there to better understand the book of Revelation. So these are different genres that we see all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? I know that was really quick. Uh, it may seem like, you know, putting a, you know, fire hose and, and trying to take in all that information. We're going to break each one of these down. So uh, at, in two weeks, when we start looking at the books of the Bible, we're going to say, okay, let's look at letters. And we're just going to talk for an hour and 15 minutes just about letters. Um, uh, about, you know, then we're going to look at Pauline letters. And vamos a ver las cartas de, de, de uh, Pablo. Solamente enfocamos en esas cartas. So we're going to break down each one of the genres, all right? So don't worry too much about that right now, uh, but just wanted to give you guys an overview of what those genres are, all right? Now, um, another thing that we need to understand when we are looking at the scripture is what is surrounding the context. What is surrounding that particular uh, context? So we want to look around the, the verses and really understand um, what is before the scripture that I'm reading and what is after the scripture that I'm reading. They use a very interesting, um, a, an interesting uh, metaphor here uh, about sports. That what we need to do when we're reading the Bible is 
we need to understand what are the rules of the game. Uh, what are the rules of the game? Okay, let's, let's do a little exercise here. In the, the sport of soccer, can I use my hands? And if I can, what positions can use their hands in the, in the, in the, in the game of soccer? The goalie can use the hands, but everyone else, what do they use? They use their feet. Okay. Yeah. In, in the sport of football, can you use your hands? Who can use their hands? Pretty much everybody, right? In the sport of basketball, can you use your hands? Okay. Do you primarily use your hands or do you kick the ball? You never kick the ball. You primarily use your hands, right? In the sport of soccer and uh, basketball, can you push and shove and tackle people? No, right? Ah, he's like, ah, I mean, you know, uh, but it's against the rules. You're not supposed to. But you can do that in football, right? You can do that in football. There are different rules in each one of these different sports. When we're reading a scripture, we want to, to think about it in that term. If I'm reading a book of poetry, do I, should I take it as a historical document with a timeline? No, we shouldn't. Because it's not a historical document with a timeline and with characters in a sequence of events. It's a book of poetry, right? It's a book of poetry. Um, so it's, it's the, the same thing. If I'm reading, and this is, this is a, a good one right here. If I'm reading... The Gospels, do I want to say, oh, well, this story is more of a poem. It's not really a historical thing about Jesus. Jesus healing this man or Jesus dying on the cross or Jesus raising from the dead is more of a metaphor than it is an actual, uh, uh, than it is an actual historical story. No, we're saying the Gospel is history. The Gospel is something that actually happened. Jesus actually died. Jesus actually rose from the dead. And so we, we want to look at the, the rules of the genre and understand them when we're reading the Scripture. Uh, so that, that's part of understanding the, kind of the, the, the surroundings. Now, when we're also studying a, pre, a specific passage, we want to look at it this way. This scripture, what is the immediate context, meaning what are the verses that surround that passage? What is the larger section? So what is the chapter that it's in? What is the rest of the book talking about? And then what is the rest of the Bible saying? Now, in this kind of chart that we have here, the passage um, is you know, your focal point. The, the, the most important part after that is the thing closest to the passage, the immediate context. Then the second most important is going to be the rest of the larger section. And then as it goes outward, it's going to be a little bit less important as far as understanding the context. But you always want to check what is going on in the scripture, uh, specifically uh, in the, that immediate context. What is happening right uh, around it? Okay? Let me... Um, let me give you a couple of examples here, all right? First uh, Peter chapter 5, 7 uh, is an encouraging verse. It says this, Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. But do we know the immediate context of what is going on here? The immediate context below reads like this. So I'm going to read, that was 5, 7. I'm going to back up and read verse 5 all the way to 9. This is what it says. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. So what we want to do is we want to look at the surrounding verses. Man, I love that scripture, cast your anxieties on him. Wonderful. That's a beautiful thing. There's a theological principle there, but what does it mean in its context? 
what is, what is, trying, what is, what is trying to be said here in its context? A careful look at the immediate context of 1 Peter 5-7 reveals that casting our cares on the Lord is strongly tied to humbling ourselves before Him. What is being said here, right? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand uh, that it may lift you up in due time. Then we see the casting in, uh, casting on of anxieties. Then the other uh, the other section talks about be self-controlled and alert. So pride says, God, I can bear the burden myself. I can do this on my own. Humility says, I can't do this on my own, God. I, I can't. I don't have the strength. Therefore, I have to give you all of my anxieties. I have to give you all of my troubles and all of my worries. Now, if we were to say cast your anxieties on, on God, right? That's a, good, that's a good principle. It's a good thought. But it's not a complete thought. A complete thought would say, cast your anxieties on God because a, apart from Him, you can do nothing. Humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I need you. That is a complete thought for the theological principle. But if we just took that one passage and didn't look at it in its immediate context, we wouldn't understand what was actually going on there. So, Again, this is why understanding the immediate context is important. We want to look at what is happening above and below uh, the scripture that we're looking at. All right? Now, um, the, the book talks a little bit about uh, some of the dangers of disregarding literary context for time's sake. I'm not going to get into them too, too much. Uh, but the, the, the big kind of ideas are here is if we're, if we're ignoring the, the surrounding context, um, we may end up trying to force uh, a scripture to mean something that it doesn't. Uh, and then the author goes into the idea of topical preaching. He says topical preaching in and of itself isn't bad, but what topical preaching will sometimes do is it will take uh, the idea that an, uh, an author or, or a, a, a writer of a biblical book is trying to say or of a passage, and then they'll try to kind of piece certain things together and take it out of context. And he gives the example of this. He says, uh, he, he, he says, like when someone writes a passage, there's thought one, thought two, thought three, thought four, thought five, and then the conclusion, and then we take our sermon out of, the, out of those things. We, we try to follow the logical uh, order of the thoughts in that scripture. What we call that is expository preaching, right? So what we're doing is we are exposing the scripture and we, we're basically following the, the scripture through its thing. Topical preaching, what it'll do, and we'll, we'll do this from time to time. We, we try to stay away from it, but uh, when done well, you actually look at what the author's intent is and, and take a topic from there. What happens sometimes, though, is if it's thought one, two, three, four, five, Topical preaching, the danger of topical preaching is saying, okay, Job chapter 2, uh, this is thought 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm going to take thought 1 from here, and then thought 3 from Psalm, and then thought 2 from Matthew, and then I'm going to try to draw a line between these verses that isn't actually there. That's where it becomes dangerous, because what you're trying to do is you're saying, okay, how can I tell people uh, to honor their father and mother? It's not a bad principle, but now I'm going to force scriptures to try to say that, um, that don't really say that. And, and so what we want to do is we want to, to really think through what is the author saying? What is their logic in, in the way that they're going uh, through that? So one of the dangers uh, is that, that we would uh, kind of get away from that as we're looking at the surrounding context. So we want to just make sure that we're looking at uh, the context and understanding it. All right? Now... Um, the next section in this uh, chapter is how to identify the surrounding context. How to identify uh, the surrounding context. So in, in this part, this is where we're going to kind of end our time, is how do we do this? How do we begin to understand that surrounding context? Um, I want to read this for you. Just imagine how a document would appear if the sentences were not linked together to form a unified message. Better yet, read this following paragraph. Let me read you this paragraph. I heard an interesting story on the news the other night. The quarterback faded back to pass, 
Carbon buildup was keeping the carburetor from functioning properly. The two inch stakes are burned on the outside, but raw on the inside. 10 feet high snow drifts block the road. The grass needed mowing. The elevator raced to the top of the 100 story building in less than a minute. The audience booed the, perform the poor performance. Have you ever met somebody that talks like that? <laughs> uh, no, right? And, and guess what? Authors usually don't write like that. Um, and, and so this is showing us how sometimes we read the scripture like that. We think that there's no connection between the scriptures. We think, okay, well, one verse says this, and then the next verse says this, and then the next verse says this, and that there is no connection between all of those verses. And I, I want to let you in on a little secret. The Bible, when it was written, didn't have chapter and verses on there. It, it didn't have that. That was added later for us to be able to find and reference things uh, as we're, we're studying the scripture. So many times we want to divide certain things up and we think, okay, I'm just going to read this one verse when in actuality we need to understand how these sentences work together. If not, what we're doing is we're reading like this and say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to focus on the 10 feet high snow drift block the road, right? And I'm going to ignore the part that says the grass needed mowing or the other one because in our minds we think that there's nothing that's correlating the two things. So identifying the surrounding context is important because what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to see where are those connections? How are these verses actually linking up? Where do the thoughts begin and where do the thoughts end? The first thing that we want to do is we want to identify how the book is divided into paragraphs and sections. So um, here we're going to get real practical, okay? Let's, let's divide and look at how these, the, the book is uh, is really like split up um start with the book okay and this is going to be key for you know when you guys are going to start doing your your uh putting together and figuring out what scripture you want to read and uh present on um you're going to want to look not just at your passage not look just at the the paragraph before or after look at the whole book look at the book and then look at how that book is separated okay um, you can do this by looking at various translations and then seeing how they divided the sections. I'm going to do just a quick kind of uh, a, um, a, you know, just an example of this. Let's just open up to Matthew, okay? Open up to the book of Matthew in your Bibles. Now, a lot of you are going to have in your Bible, a heading that's going to start off. So can someone read what their heading says on that, on that first Matthew chapter 1, the heading on that? The Ancestors of Jesus. The Ancestors of Jesus. Okay, um, mine says the genealogy of Jesus. So you have chapter 1, genealogy of Jesus. Then, right there on verse 18, uh, you have another section. Does anyone have a different uh, way that it's divided? So you have your first section starts there on chapter 1. Then the next section, you're going to see another heading. What is that next heading in, in there? What do you guys have? The birth of Jesus Christ. Which one? The birth of Jesus Okay, and that starts at what, at what uh, verse? 18. Okay, verse 18. Does, any, does anyone else have that in their Bibles? Right? So... We can say, as we're writing down, right, we're splitting up, identifying the book, we're going to say chapter 1 is divided into two sections, right? The genealogy of Jesus, 1 through 17, and the, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, 18 through uh, 25. So then we would say this is how this chapter is, is uh, divided. Uh, chapter 2 is divided into what, in this translation, it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, four different sections or four different headings. So you can use your Bible. What I would do is I'd use different translations. Check your ESV, check your King James, check your uh, um, New Living Translation, and look at what are the differences between that. 
There's a word that we use for that. It's called Paracope. Um, there's there's a, a software that you can find that will actually uh, show you. And, and uh, so Logos is, it shows this where you can put all of your translations and it'll break down each one of, it'll say, okay, this is uh, chapter one has these sections and it'll have the name of each one of the sections and it'll show you the differences between the translations. Um, you can use uh, resources like commentaries as well. A commentary will have, um, it'll have like chapter one and it'll show you on there verses 1 through 12 and it'll say what that sub what the theme of verses 1 through 12 is you know chapter 2 verses this and that and commentaries will help you with that another one is bibleproject.com all right how many of y'all have heard of bibleproject.com not heard of it okay this is bibleproject.com's website uh sister rudiman gave me this um, and this is uh, all of the Bible Project videos um, but for the books of the Bible, but it's broken down. So it's basically like a little comic. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it basically what it does, this, the, the Bible Project videos, is they will break down a book for you, and they will go in and they will show you the different sections and themes of the book. I'm going to show you just a quick, quick uh, video. I'm going to just play the first part. We won't play the whole thing because um, we're running out of time here. But... Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to kind of narrate what's happening here, but basically what these videos will say is they're telling, giving you a backstory. Uh, Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen from Colossae who likely met Paul during his missions to Ephesus. It's giving you a backstory on what's, you know, what happens in this particular book um, and, uh, and, you know, what is going on here. You know, who are the characters in this particular letter? Who's it writing to, the original audience? Uh, so it's breaking that down. And then as you kind of go into the video, you'll start to see that he'll start to uh, um, break down the verses. So verses 1 through 7 are an opening prayer. Um, and then he'll go in and talk about what, you know, is being said here and what it means in its context and some of the history and things like that. So this is an incredible uh, tool to use in order to really kind of look at a specific book. You'll get a, a big general overview on one of the books of the Bible. I love doing this. Um, and so anytime that I'm going to be studying a passage from a book, I'll usually watch one of these videos first just to kind of get in my mind, okay, what's been going on here? What's happening? Is there something that I've missed uh, in the context? What, what, when was the book written? What is the history behind it? And so it's, it's animated, so you know it, it gives it kind of a visual guide here. But they've got all kinds of stuff. And I didn't know that they had actually, um, in the Bible Project website, they've actually really, really uh, done a lot of stuff here. Um, yeah, they've got a podcast as well, and they've got like, this is their new video called Blessing and Curse, and so it's talking about blessing and curses in the Bible. Uh, it talks, uh, they've got a, an app, they've got uh, all kinds of themes as well. So you've got um, Blessing and Curse, uh, Eternal Life, the Royal Priesthood, they've got one on the Gospel where they break down, they understand the Gospel, uh, you, so you can understand the Gospel easily. Um, uh, movements, links. So movements and links are uh, how do we understand, again, biblical interpretation. What are the links between passages? How do we see movements in Scripture? So um, uh, the great resource, great resource. Uh, I love it, and I'll usually use this to kind of get some general overviews on that. So just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, you know, Bible Project, great. The podcast is good, too. I think it's two guys on the podcast, right, that, that do it. Um, so, again, Divide uh, your, your book into, uh, uh, d into paragraphs, sections, do that. Then the second thing is this, summarize the main idea of each section in about a dozen words or less. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll mention this particular area. So you'll say, this is my book, this is the context of the book, uh, and then this is the theological principle that we drew from uh, the, the scripture. Okay, now... I want you to look at this, this particular page. Uh, some of you know that we have been doing a sermon series on Sundays uh, on the book of James. The book of James is all about uh, living the Christian life, right? How do we understand it? How do we live the Christian life? Now, um, the, the, as you see here, the title of the series is Being and Doing. Before I ever got the title of the series, before I ever figured out, okay, what are we going to call this? Um, I did this little chart. And so this is an example of what I did when we, you know, this was probably in 
October when I was thinking, okay, I want to preach on the book of James in October. I started thinking about it. Um, and so I went down and I, I, I pulled out my computer. I pulled out logos. I pulled out my Bible. And I said, before I ever get into the book of James, what, let, let me break this down. Let me look at all the themes that are in the book of James. So um, I, I went in and I looked and I saw the Bible was divided in, in, in verses 1 through 8. Right? There's five chapters in the book of James. Verse 1 through 8 is a testing of faith. That's the theme there. And then I looked at what are the sub-themes. Uh, it, it starts with a greeting. It has trials. Uh, it talks about the poor and the rich. It talks about trials and temptations. And then it talks about the gift of salvation. So I wrote that out. I'm summarizing the main idea of each one of those sections. Section number 2 was verses uh, 19 through 26 there in chapter 1. Uh, it's called hearing and doing. That's the theme there. Hearing, speaking in anger, doing, not just being a hearer of the word of God, right? A life transformed is a life of action. These are all themes that I saw in those particular scriptures. Uh, favoritism and partiality. Uh, faith without works is dead. Uh, chapter 3, 1 through 12, taming the tongue. 13 through 18, a life marked by wisdom. Uh, 1 through 17 was things to avoid. Then I broke down the, that, that whole chapter from things to avoid into different sections. Worldliness and pride, 1 through 6. 7 through 10 is humility and submission. 11 through 12 is judgment of others. 13 through 17 is boastfulness and our will, trying to do our will. Uh, then 5 uh, is warning to the rich, patience and suffering, effective faith-filled prayer. So what I did before I ever even went into one specific verse, I wanted to get a general overview, right? And I wanted to summarize those main ideas. So a couple of things to think about in this particular section is think about the topic or the main idea. What is the main theme that the author is wanting to, to communicate in that section? And then uh, what is the author, what is he saying about the main idea? So what I mean by that is this. Many times we can read something and then we'll say, this is the main idea. What I would, I would suggest that you guys do is look at what the author says the main idea is. Because a lot of times in the scripture, especially when you're dealing with letters, you'll see the author say, this is what I'm trying to say. Now here I'm going to say it to you. Do not yield to temptation, right? Now this is how you don't do it. So many times the author will speak to you and tell you, you know, straightforward, this is what I'm about to tell you. Now let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, right? Um, so, you know, look for those little clues inside of each one of the sections. Uh, look for the clues that we see there. The third and final thing is this. Explain how the section you are studying relates to the surrounding sections. So notice the author's flow uh, and ensure the meaning that you're, you are extracting really fits the context. Look for movements within the scripture. And, and again, I'm going to use the, James as an example. I know they use the book of Philemon uh, in, in here as an example, but because we've been studying the book of James, I'm going to use this. You're going to see, for example, testing of faith, right? Hearing and doing. As you start to read those scriptures, you're going to see this idea of trials and temptations go back and forth. And he's going to interject and move into a different subject and then come back and move out and come back. And you're going to see this kind of weaving there. You're going to see in the next one, favoritism and partiality. Then you're going to see this idea of faith without works. But you're actually going to see a movement between favoritism and partiality. Um, you're going to see how he goes from favoritism and partiality. He moves into faith without works, but he basically comes back and says, hey, the works is don't show favoritism and partiality. So you're going to see this connection in the themes. Then he's going to talk about how if you're going to have works, part of doing works is taming the tongue. Control your speech, what you say. Um, and, and, and he's going to tie that into um, wisdom. And you're going to see when he, we get into, uh, in two weeks, this idea of a life marked by wisdom, you're going to see this idea. He's going to come back to faith without works is dead. If you want to show that you have wisdom, then you show you have wisdom by your works. So there are these themes that are, that are kind of going in and out in the book of James. And what our job is to do is to see how does our passage that we're reading, how does it relate 
to the other passages? How does it relate to something that happened in chapter 2, something that happened in chapter 4? So these are things that we want to think about, all right? Again, keep this sheet because once we get into the actual books of the Bible in a couple of weeks, this is going to be very helpful when you're doing your own uh, personal Bible study. Um, and this, again, a lot of this is just step one. We're just right now looking at step one. Next week, we're going to look at uh, meaning and application. That's going to be where we're going to get into step three, uh, where we're looking at theological principles. But step one and two, this is really what we're focusing in on right now, is understanding the context, understanding what it meant to the original audience, understanding what the scripture means within the, the whole book, uh, the context of the whole book. All right? Um, any, any questions uh, on all this. I know we moved kind of quickly on this, but I wanted to cover a lot of ground here um, with, with the literary context. But is there any questions on this? I just had kind of a comment, question slash comment. Mm -hmm. I can understand the danger of out of context interpretation, you know, that you don't want to misinterpret the Bible. Uh, and yet, I think sometimes. The Lord speaks to us in different ways, in strange ways, in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. For example, there was a time in my life when I was compromising mm -hmm. my relationship with the Lord. Yeah. And I was attending a bilingual church. I was driving from job number one to job number two. And this word just came to my mind, menos preciado. Mm. And I thought, menos preciado. Menos is minus, preciado is like precious, so it's, it's translated despised. Mm -hmm. I was despising the Lord. And then I had a friend, George Garcia, who said, Brother, you're compromising in mm -hmm. your relationship with God. And I felt convicted. Mm -hmm. But that word, it may be in different places, but perhaps the most common place is in Isaiah 53, where... Jesus was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Mm -hmm. So the context of that scripture is on Jesus, yeah. him being despised. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm just thinking about this in terms of the way the Lord speaks to us. <clears throat> the way he speaks to us through his word, we have to be careful that we don't misinterpret the scripture. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side, there's a danger of limiting God in terms of how He communicates with us. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I, I, you know, I highly respect the importance of, of what you're doing to make sure that people are interpreting the Word of God correctly. Mm -hmm. And yet, I can see sometimes the danger in potentially limiting the manner in which God speaks to us. Yeah. It, I mean, as long as it doesn't contradict. And, and I think that's the key there, is the contradiction part. And, and that's why we, we, we use these rules, right, of the game, because the problem is, you know, very easily the Lord could have spoken to you, but how do we know, and I'm, to be very honest with you, brother, how do we know that it wasn't a, a demonic spirit that was speaking to you and telling you menos preciado and, and, and adding something in there that was just completely out. So the, the way that we know that is by looking at the scripture in, in context. And so sometimes we want to go by the emotion or this or that. And I think we have to be very careful there because God does. And I don't, I don't disagree with you. I think God does speak in, in, in different ways. But we do need to be very careful with that because what that can do is what we're doing is we're filtering it through our experience and our emotion. And if we're not careful with that and we don't and we don't take that experience emotion and then use the Bible as the guide, then that's where we can get into trouble. And so I think um, and I appreciate your comment. I think we, we you're, you're absolutely right. And we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit when we get into meaning and application uh, in two weeks. But um, at the same time, I think we do want to be very careful because. I mean, the, the word, uh, the menos preciado, was the, what the English translation was despised, right? Talking about Jesus, um, we could take that scripture, and if we're not careful, we could just take that one specific word in, in that scripture of Jesus being despised 
and take that out of context to mean something that it, that it doesn't. Um, because if we're completely honest, that scripture doesn't really have very much to do with compromise. Um, you know, when we look at that, you know, Jesus compromising, because Jesus didn't compromise, right? Jesus wasn't a, someone who compromised. I could try to take that and fit in. If I'm not careful, I could say, well, you know, I compromised. Maybe Jesus compromised here. The theological principle would be Jesus never compromised, right? So we just need to be careful with it. And I, I appreciate that comment, and I think that's, that's a good thing to, to understand and know. And, and I don't disagree with you in the sense that God uses different ways, and God uses brothers and sisters, and God even uses maybe sometimes when you're driving and a, and a specific word pops into mind, and man, you know what, Lord, there's a conviction in my heart that maybe I've been compromising on these certain things. But then to go in and to take a scripture that maybe doesn't have anything to do with that and try to force the text to mean that, I think that might be doing an injustice to that specific scripture. Um, I would say, you know, well, the Lord spoke to me in this way, just kind of, you know, convicting me and bringing this to mind. I would maybe leave it there rather than saying, okay, and then I went and found this word and I ran across this word and it, you know, and, and, and I kind of try to make it to fit this particular thing. That's just, that's me. And just because I can see, I see more of the danger of taking that scripture out of context than I do uh, following the rule of biblical interpretation, um, you know, and limiting God. That's just in, in my personal experience, I've seen more danger come from one rather than the other. Now, should we have a balance? Yes. But I would try to always err on the, on the side of, you know, trying to make sure that we keep that, that scripture in context. That's, that's kind of my, my personal opinion. Yeah. Talking about... Uh... There's different ways that God speaks. I remember like 18 years ago, 20 years ago, I was going to a Bible study and there was this particular father and son that used to come. Father was about 60, 70. And his testimony or his participation usually in the Bible study was that he would always share about dreams. Mm -hmm. And that supposedly he said that the Lord spoke to him uh, through the dreams. Mm -hmm. And I got kind of leery because you know, he would never mention that the Lord would confirm it to his word. Mm -hmm. or he yeah. would never mention anything having to do with the word. Whatever he brought, it was always having to do with dream. And I really was very, very about, you know, like, uh, actually basing my walk. And, and that's how I want yeah. to be. I, I really want to be able to led by his word and, and, and his uh, and gentle self. Yeah. You know, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. And, and I think those are the things, again, we take the experiences, we take the things that we go through and we filter them through the word of God, right? You know, if someone said something, they had a dream about something, okay, you know, I'll listen, but how does that match up with what the word of God says? And if it doesn't, and, and like you're saying, everything is just this, then, then I, I'll be a little, a little leery of that, you know, because we want to, we want to be wise about, you know, how we, we take things. And I've had, you know, I've been a Christian for almost 20 something years now and you know uh, around in ministry for for years and years and and you know I've had a lot of people tell me dreams that they've had about me or dreams that they've had and wanted me to interpret dreams or different things like that and and uh and again I'll listen but at the same time how does that how does that how do we filter that through what the word of God says and if it is something that is completely outside of what we see in the scripture then those are the things, and, and, you know, Paul talks about it, about, you know, false teachers and, and how do we understand these things in their, in their context. And, you know, we want to always hold them up to the light of Scripture um, to, to interpret those things. So, anything else? Um, all right. If there's nothing else, then I'll pray and we'll be, we'll be finished, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy, uh, Lord, for just the, the privilege and the ability it is to, to be here, uh, Lord, to, to be able to, to look at your word, to study what your word says, and, and to just be faithful in understanding it, Father. I pray that we would uh, be able to approach the, the, the scripture with wisdom, approach you with wisdom, that we would understand uh, what it is to, to listen to your voice, Father God. Um, and and to to do the 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 uh, the right 
thing in, 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 in interpreting the Bible, Father God, to, to do it well, to do it faithfully, uh, but to do it, Lord, in a way that's effective, um, Father, that, that at the end of the day, uh, that we wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, just about the, the knowledge or the technical aspects or any of these things, that, that at the end of the day, Father God, we would be uh, doing all of this, all of the biblical interpretation, so that we might be able to connect with the one true living God, that we would connect with you, that we would understand uh, who you are, and that ultimately that would shape and transform our lives so that we might be able to live out the Christian life and bring more people to know who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.